Satan wants to destroy America. People come here to this country from a failed uh, system, failed system that's just literally terrible, and want to make the same thing happen here that failed where they came from. It's amazing. It amazes me. Uh, we have um, an election coming up uh, that is going to be, whoever wins, don't matter, it's going to be war. I feel. I don't want it to happen. I pray it doesn't happen. There's just some people that ain't going to accept it. There's just some people going to, regardless of who it is, what wins. <laughs> some people's not going to accept it. But Satan wants to destroy the last evangelistic instrument, the last evangelistic country that puts missionaries across the world. He wants to destroy this country. And it's, uh, it's happening. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of things. We have pleaded for things. We had a deal here where we have prayer, invited at least 20 pastors to come to be with us as we're going to pray for America. Not one show. People just don't care. They have never been so much uh, just neglect of what is needed for this country. And I can't believe it, a revival. Now, I think it will take place after it happens. I think people will turn to God like you won't believe after it happens. Too late. It's going to be too late for in a lot of respects. First Peter chapter 5. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Think he's devoured anybody? You think he's still seeking? You, th you think we got trouble? Now, you look at our homes. Our homes are worse than they've ever been before. Someone told me the other day, four out of five marriages now end in divorce. Can you, I, have, I have a hard time with that. I may, I may not be true, but that's what I heard. Four out of five marriages end in divorce. When I first went into ministry, it was one out of five, I think, or four, something like that. Um, we, have, we have the school system. I've never seen anything like the school system in our country today. I mean, people, there's, there's people that are talking about telling everybody that America really did not start till after the Civil War. That's when, that's when uh, the blacks were freed and uh, all of this and all that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's, what they, that's what they say. And I don't know how, how that, that could have happened. But I do know that uh, I heard something the other day that I never thought about much. Um, they're mad because they want to put this lady that's a conservative on the Supreme Court. And now here's what they say. Now, if they get in on the other side, they want to pack the court. That means they're going to take six people and put it on the court to offset the one that was put on by them so they'll have a liberal court on every decision. Now, I don't know how you can do that, but that's, that's, that's uh, this is what they're talking about. I've never heard about that. But anyway, they tried it before. Roosevelt, I understand, tried to do that back in the, in the, in the 30s. He tried to pack the court. Now, I, I, it evidently didn't happen, so evidently there is a stopping procedure. You can put, put a stop to somebody. But does anybody want, does anybody, does anybody care anymore, I wonder? Does churches care anymore? Does, uh, people, people, you know, they just, they just they got into a thing where uh, they just don't care. They don't care whether they go to church, whether they pray, whether they read the Bible, whether they uh, tithe, whether they, whether they do anything. They just, don't, they just don't care. They just want to do what they want to do. Well, that's what Satan wants, and that's what he has pretty well got in the United States of America today. We are in trouble, ladies and gentlemen, because of verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. I want to talk about him a little bit today. Mr. Average Christian doubts the reality of his adversary, the devil. This could be the reason that he's average. <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, my preacher told me as I got saved as a 17-year-old rebel... He told me, Sandy, if you'll take my advice, you'll make it. 
He said, it takes three services a week to survive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And he mentioned that word average to me, and that's why I thought about it today. He says, don't be an average Christian. Well, I never wanted to be average in anything I ever did at the time. I wanted to win at everything I ever tried to do. But he used that word average. Uh, I think it was Lee Robertson who said it takes three to thrive, or maybe Lester Roloff, I can't remember. It takes three to thrive, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, if you're going to thrive and not become average. An average Christian don't do much. Now, I have watched in the 50-some years I've been in the ministry uh, things that are happening in different denominations. I mean, there's things that goes on in churches today that wasn't even heard of back in the 50s or the 40s that are happening today in churches. We, most churches teach what is called dress down instead of dress up. We see uh, Sunday night services being closed down, Wednesday night services no longer existing, and independent Baptist churches, by the way. Because our adversary, the devil, is still walking around doing what he can. There is new ideas. Roloff used to say there's nothing new is true and nothing true is new. So you see, the old time religion, people today are scared of because they say we are afraid of change. Well, Jesus didn't change, nor does God change. Some things don't change. Now, I understand bicycles change. I understand cars change as you make them. There's a change. It was called model change. I remember correctly when I worked at Ford Motor Company. I couldn't wait for model change because I got two weeks off. But you know what? There's a model change, all right? Now, but the devil comes along, and he wants the home to change. He wants the, the, um, the education system to change. Uh, he wants our churches to change. And independent fundamental Baptist churches, I don't know if Paul's having problems going to the, the churches that uh, have changed their philosophy and no longer they're going to have evangelistic services or no longer they're going to have uh, prayer meetings or revival meetings or anything like that. So, And then uh, Satan comes along with the, in, the election infection, which I call it <laughs> today, that's running around, you know, and scaring half the people half to death. Uh, and the thing of it is, is where's your God? Where's God at at this time? Uh, why is all of a sudden something bigger than God? Uh, I believe uh, there's diseases out there. I've been fighting them ever since I was a little kid. I had rheumatic fever when I was seven. I had the mumps and I had the measles. I think I even had the chicken pox. I don't know what I had, but I had a bunch of things when I was a kid growing up. I had to deal with those things. And uh, you know what? In, in, in 1918, when they had the big flu epidemic that killed uh, 750, 800,000 people, my great-grandmother being one of them, she died, but I understand that the, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series that year. <laughs> they didn't shut down baseball. Fans were in the stands. Uh, I understand that, um, uh, that uh, every, man, every man got up and went to work. Of course, there's a lot of farming going back in those days, but everybody lived a life just as if it was normal because a disease was a disease, and they've been messing with diseases for, for since the beginning of time. So we always have had a problem with colds, and we've had problems with one thing or another that has made a person sick, but you just go on. Well, now the world has come to an end because of a disease that 99.8% of the people that contact it survive. It's an amazing thing to me. But anyway, I wanted to just share a few things about what's happening. The devil wants America destroyed. And it's, it's happening. You say, well, don't you believe in revival? I do. I do believe in revival. But I also believe that God judges the people that he's given opportunities to and opportunities to. And I've read my Bible enough to know that judgment will fall if you disobey. There's something, something. There's, you just can't keep killing babies and expect God to bless your country. You can't change the marriage 
and expect God to bless you. You can't change a man's idea of whether or not he wants to be a man or a woman and expect God to bless you. You know, if you believe the Bible, you know, they said uh, that when uh, uh, the angels went into Sodom and Gomorrah, they only, he, only, he asked for just a few people. Well, they couldn't even find a few people. Uh, well, now, we can find more than that now uh, here in America. No doubt there's a lot of born-again people in this country. But no doubt we have done things, though, that uh, uh, I don't even think Sodom and Gomorrah have done, personally. So anyway, we're in a trouble. We're in trouble, and we're walking the way of Satan. And he's walking around, seeking whom he may devour. Politicians. Harry Truman said, if you go into politics and come out rich, you're a crook. And uh, Nancy Pelosi is a crook. And I don't know who else. Now, you can say one thing about Mr. Uh, Trump, and you don't like him or whatever you think about him, but I'll tell you one thing. He's lost money since he's been in the presidency. Yeah, I mean, he's lost a lot of money. And uh, he has given away a lot of money. He don't even take a salary. He doesn't need to take a salary, but he doesn't take one. But there's been other rich people that took it that was in the office. It's all about money. The Clintons went in poor, and look at them today. Uh, Obamas went in poor, but look at them today. So anyway, uh, the whole idea of using politics to become rich is one thing. You see, you're supposed to go into politics to make your country better. You see, uh, churches are supposed to become better. Um, countries are supposed to become better, not worse. But anyway, Jesus and the devil had an attack had a conversation up on a mountain. Uh, if you want to, turn to Matthew chapter 4 and look at that with me real quick like. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, Matthew chapter 4 verse number 1. The Bible says, then was Jesus led up of the, of the spirit unto the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. Well, can you imagine? You don't eat for 40 days. You know what they call, you know what, what you know why they call breakfast breakfast? Because it breaks a fast. You go to bed like at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock, you don't get up till 7, then you fasted for those. And when you eat breakfast, you break that fast. That's what's called breakfast. Now, 40 days. I got sick one time, real sick. And I didn't eat for two or three days. But when I finally ate, I ate. 40 days now and 40 nights. That's the same length of time that it rained. Remember the rain and the floods that came? Well, Jesus fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. And when he, the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. All right, now think about that. He, he's weak. In phys he's physically weak here. He hadn't ate for 40 days and 40 nights. Isn't that right? I always tell people Jesus in his weakest, weakest, and weakest, and weakest condition was by far stronger than any Christian ever lived. He says, if, you, if thou be the son of God, you see that word if? Can you imagine Satan trying to put doubt on the son of God? Because he was in a weakened condition, you see. He was hungry. He was weak. And then he thought, he had the audacity to think that because Jesus was in a weakened condition and hadn't ate for 40 days and 40 nights, that he could put doubt upon who he was. He said, if. He said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I was uh, there in Israel just last year or two seen that place you know Jesus always quoted the Bible didn't get mad 
Uh, I've had so many people cuss me and get mad at me all because I just quoted the Bible. to Don't quote that book to me. I said, well, I'm telling you, it's God's book. The very God that made you wrote it, so why wouldn't you want to listen to it? Because you don't want to be told by what, you know what the biggest problem with people today is? They don't want to be told nothing. You know why church attendants are down now? They don't want to be told nothing. They want to live the way they want to live. They want to do what they want to do. They want to say what they want to say. They want to be what they want to be. They don't want to be told that they have to do something. He says, command that these stones be made bread. Now, you know, that was an interesting thought. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. I mean, if I hadn't ate 40 days, I'd be screaming for bread. I'd be crawling in. I'd eat bread out of a garbage can if I hadn't ate for 40 days. Hey, ask a beggar. Hey, listen, ask a poor person that lives on the, in the streets and in the alleys what they will eat after they haven't ate for a while. Jesus was weakened. He says, Command, could Jesus have made the stones be bread? Sure he could have. Yeah, he could have. But see, Jesus had a better idea here. Man, Jesus said this. He said, I'm going to teach you something. I want to teach you, despite the fact that I'm hungry, I want to share something with you and the world when they read this. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Stop right there. You're not going to live by bread alone. You think that all there is to life is because you're hungry, you want bread? You think you'll jump at that just at the heartbeat just because you're hungry? No. I mean, most people in the world would. No doubt about it. But what Jesus is trying to people of the world to know is this. Man don't live by bread alone. There's more things important than bread. I mean, here he is, hadn't ate for 40 days. Now, some people hadn't ate for 40 days, starving to death. Is not going to take that advice. Man shall not live by bread alone. The only thing that's on that man's mind is what he can get in his mouth. So Jesus, hold it. There's something more important than that. I don't care how hungry you are. I don't care how devastated you are. I don't care. I don't care. Hey, you're trembling. You got the shakes. You go about. You're ready. You're ready to, you know, uh, eat a horse and chase the rider. You know, uh, you know. You don't matter. It, it, it don't matter. Something more important than that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, I always want you to always tell people to underline the word every there. Because, you know, there are some things in the Bible that has, that's strange for some people to understand. In the Old Testament especially. If a child becomes rebellious in the Old Testament, what did the judges tell him to do? Kill him, stone him. Well, that's hard, isn't it? Uh, we, t- we tell guys today, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to wear long hair. Oh, 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 oh. Guy asked me one time, he said, what's well, long? I said, opposite of long is short. But then I know to tell. But I didn't say that. Well, Jesus had long hair. How could he tell me that? I, who, who, who knows that Jesus had long hair? Who took that picture of him? I want to see the picture. You know, I understand, don't know that I'm right or not, but I'll tell you what I understand. Let me step aside the pulpit. I understand that the first person that ever drew a picture of Jesus with long hair was homosexual and drew him how he seen him. Don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. And I can understand that if that be the case. <clears throat> it's how you see Jesus. See, Jesus, guy told me one time, well, you had to wear their hair long then because they didn't, they didn't, have, they didn't have nothing to cut their hair with. Well, they Sure found a way to shear those sheep, didn't they? I guess if they shear those sheep, they could sure, they could sure cut a person's hair, couldn't they? Well, anyway, people look for reasons. See, if people look for reasons to eat rather than, than feast on the Word of God. People find reasons not to go to church, and they'll come up with all kinds of excuses. I've heard everyone you can hear. Um, Guy asked me one time, he said, Brother CB, he said, what would you do if somebody very close to you, family member, came to your house on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and uh, would you stay home with him? I said, no. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm in church on Sunday. Anybody that comes expecting me to stay home is going to stay home by themselves if they don't want to come with me because I go to church because that's where I'm supposed to be. 
When I was in the military, there were certain times I was supposed to be certain places, and that better be there. It didn't matter what. You just better be there. It didn't matter if somebody come to visit. Hey, my, my, hey, my mom's going to come down to see me down here in basic training. Mother didn't come down to see you in basic training. They wouldn't let you see your mother in basic training. Now, I don't know what they do today, but they sure wouldn't do it when I was there. Now, notice verse number five. Our verse number four said, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, that's the Bible, by the way, today. Everything that is in the Bible came from God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God wrote all these words, the Bible says. Now, he used man to pen the words. Man penned them, and he was moved as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. All scripture, though, is given by inspiration of God. Yeah, I remember they asked President Obama. He said, well, the Bible says that the person was a homosexual. He said, he said now, you know that's not true. He says, you know, he says, if, if we kill every homosexual in America, he said, well, there wouldn't be any rocks. That's true. Probably not. I don't know. But for the President of the United States, says the Bible is not true is uh, going a little bit too far. But that didn't bother him, nor does it bother anybody today. People just do what they want to do. I don't care, they said. I had a lady tell me one time, I said, do you care about going to hell? No, I don't care. You will the day you get there. I told my brother one time, he was, I tried my best to get my brother saved. He's saved now. Gary is. I had him working with me, Rita. My sister, by the way. My sister over here. Uh, my brother, your full brother, by the way, was working with me on a roof one time, hot, cat, hot tar roof. They boil, I think, around 400 degrees. I think that, that tar boils. I got scars all the way up and down my arms from that popping on me when I was a kid. And I had Gary with me one time, and I was talking to him about the Lord. He said, Sandy, why don't you go, t t go talk to somebody who don't pay his taxes? I said, what's the world has that got to do with anything that I'm talking about here? Go talk to a bad guy. Don't support his family. Don't talk to me. I do what I'm supposed to do. <clears throat> I said, Gary, I want you to do me a favor. He said, what? I said, I want you to go over there to that hot kettle over there and take your hand and stick your hand down in it. He looked at me and he says, <clears throat> do you think I'm a fool? I said, yes, I do. Yeah, I think you're a fool. Anybody that will turn down the love of God and what he did on the cross at Calvary is a fool. No other way to say it. The Bible says a man who says there is no God is a fool. I say a man that does not want to receive God and, his, and what he has done for him is a fool. Gary, my brother, by the way, is a Christian today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But you see, the thing of it is, it says, we live, by the way, by everything that comes out of the Bible. That's how we live. Yeah. A uh, man broke into the church one time. Um, had to call the policeman for the police here out to the church. And Mr. Dunkelson showed up. I don't know if you guys know Mr. Dunkelson, but he's six foot ten inches tall. Paul knows him. Uh, we had him out here one time when Paul pulled a truck up 32 Highway with his teeth. And... Uh, he made the wrong statement to Paul. I loved it. I listened to Paul, watched his answer. <clears throat> Paul, he goes up to Paul and he says, uh, now, because he, he, he's there to block off the traffic off of 32 Highway here. Oh, church is out there, man. We had a lot of people out there. Had, everybody was out there. And Paul's going to pull that truck with 75 kids in it up 32 Highway. He's going to pull it with his teeth. Well, first of all, the cop didn't believe it. You know, like anybody else. Anywhere you go, there's always those that don't believe something. You know, the world is full of unbelievers. And so, big six foot, uh, ten inch Dunkelson goes up to five foot. Was, how tall is it? Five ten? Five foot ten, Paul Wren, 365 pounds about then, I think. And says to him, mistake. What he's about to say is a mistake. I knew it was a mistake the minute it came out of his mouth. I watched the expression in Paul Wren when the man looked at him and said, 
how far are you going to try to pull this? Or try just really got to Paul. He said, try. Try. He said, I'm not going to try. I'm going to pull the truck. Now, I'm going to show you how I'm going to pull the truck. Here's what I want you to do, Mr. Officer. I want you to get on the front of the truck and sit there so you can have a bird's eye view of me pulling the truck so you will not doubt it. Well, he didn't get on the truck, but he watched him pull it. And Paul, you could tell, Paul was not happy with the statement. So when he, when the, see, the, the, the truck, truck's kind of at a, at a, it's kind of a going downhill there, right there by the side of the church. You know where it goes down by the side of the church? He took his foot, bam! He kicked that truck, pushed it backwards, yanked that truck, and started walking back. When he got through, he put this thing down, he looked at the police officer and said, that far enough for you? You see, trying is not trusting. We believe today that we... We trust everything that comes out of this book because God said it. Most people do not trust this book. They do not believe that God did or can do what he said he did do. It's always been a world today of full of unbelieving people who doubted what God can do. See, God can do anything. And he loves showing people that. Now, first of all, he's got a son that's on a mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He hasn't ate. He's hungry because he's in the flesh. See, God had to take a body to die for your sins. He had to be in a body. And the body limited him. In other words, he got hungry. He said to himself when he's on the cross, I thirst. He got thirsty. He was all God, but yet he was all man. And Satan was trying to take away the perfect plan from him. See, God and him had a plan. See, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit sat down years before this all began and had a plan. He knew what he was doing. Verse number 5, Then the devil taketh him up on a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If, there's that word again, If, Trying to put doubt upon who he was. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written concerning thee, and in, thy, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He shall give you angels to take care of you. Well, I believe God gives us angels to take care of us. One time I watched a little kid. I bet he was one, one, maybe one, might be one year old, maybe one and a half, tumble down the steps. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, a bit, it was an old home. Steps on. Got down to the bottom, jumped right up. Now, I can't imagine what happened to me if I just tumbled down those steps. But that little kid got me. Who took care of that baby coming down there? I believe everybody has an angel. How would you like to have been the angel that got to take care of Jesus while he was on earth? Wouldn't that have been great? When I was in Israel, ladies and gentlemen, I, I went into the tomb where Jesus was buried. I stood there. My heart came, kind of stood at attention. You know? I sat there. And there's always those that question whether or not that's the exact place or this or that, but it didn't matter to me that day. There was nobody in it. <laughs> and that's what they say it was. And I just took it for what it said. I said, all right, that's where he buried. And I stood there and looked at that place. And I mean, I don't know how emotional you guys get, but I get real emotional sometimes. I'm going through a hard time in my life right now. 
Sometimes it's good to show your emotions. Some people, you don't, you don't want to ever get so hard that you can't cry or you can't weep and you can't get to a point in your life where people can't see that you're normal. And I sat there at that tomb and I held my wife's hand and I, I said, right there, Debbie, up from the grave he arose. Right there. Up from the grave. He was right there he was. I said, he came out of that grave, Debbie, for us. That's what I told him. Yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the angels are always there to take care of you. They took care, in fact, after this temptation of Satan was over with. You'll find here in the scriptures where the angels took him off and took care of him. And that's what they do. But see, what Jesus was doing while he was up there, a lot of people maybe not, maybe never heard this before, but what Jesus was doing while he was up there in a mountain being tempted by the devil was taking care of us. He was taking care of us. Verse number 6 says, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to him, it is written. Notice how he put so much emphasis on the scripture. Isn't it amazing today that the Bible is the most purchased book in the world, but the least read? It's the emphasis on the scripture. So what's Satan's job today? Keep you from reading the book that will help you the most. Jesus said unto him, it is written again that thou shalt not tempt to the Lord thy God. Verse 8, and I have to hustle. Got prayer meeting here in a minute. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Let me tell you guys something. Satan will give anything to get you to worship him. You say that they weren't his to give Jesus. They were. He was a Satan. He was the devil of this earth. He was the father of this earth. Satan was. He literally could have done that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt him. You know what America's done? You know what some of our leaders have done in this country today? They have tempted the Lord thy God and will pay the price for it. They have changed the way he constructed the marriage. They tried to change the way they were created from a male to a female. They have changed the Bible. They have changed the way you worship church. Some people have worship in church. They tried to change. I'm glad for what Jesus said. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we love you and thank you for this time that we're about to pray. Bless our services today. Be with Brother Paul as he speaks. Be with his uh, wife. Thank you so much for the safe trip up here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.